My daughter-in-law sent me a picture of a large dining table and asked if I could build something similar. This is not the picture because I don't have permission to use it. This is a picture of the table I made. Some would call it a ripoff. I prefer to call it a tribute. She wanted the top to be 88 inches by 42 inches with interesting and beautiful dark green. It was clearly a challenging project and a lot of work, but I'm retired and easily amused. After too little consideration, I said, yes, I could make the table, but I would need to use a convoluted trial and error process with lots of opportunities for mistakes. After a few seconds of thought, she said, okay, knock yourself out. So the adventure began. The first step was finding suitable material. Fortunately, Gobi Walnut Products, a Portland, Oregon company, is only about 30 minutes away. They specialize in walnut slabs and have a large warehouse for shopping. We found a beautiful pair of bookend cut slabs that were big enough. However, they were both rough cut and twisted and bowed by as much as an inch. Each slab weighed about 150 pounds. I had nothing in my shop big enough to use as a work table and only a router and hand sanders to flatten and smooth the surface. I had made a simple router sled before while building a much smaller table. There are dozens of YouTube videos featuring router sleds, both commercial and DIY. Almost all require the operator to manually move the router. This is tedious, time-consuming work, especially for a large area using a small router. I thought it would be interesting to automate the router movement by using a computer to control motors to move the router left and right on the rails and toward and away on the sled. I didn't expect to save any time doing this, but the time would be more interesting. I started by making a work table using a small freestanding cabinet on wheels. A 2x4 frame was added to the cabinet. The outside dimensions were 96 by 53 inches. Legs with adjustable height wheels were added to the four corners so the whole assembly could be moved. It easily supported the slabs and left room for easy access all around. The slabs were trimmed on all sides using a circular saw and then roughly sanded using a belt sander. To flatten, the slabs were made more flexible by using a circular saw to cut curves about two-thirds of the way through on a two-inch square grid. Clamps and weights were then used to flatten out the twists and bows. Epoxy was poured to completely fill the saw curves. After the epoxy cured, the slabs were joined. Four U-channels, two by one by 36 inches, were embedded to increase the stability across the joint. Dados were cut to match the mounting brackets on the table legs. Another epoxy pour was used to level, strengthen, and seal the back so moisture could not enter or leave the slab. The top now weighed over 200 pounds, more than I could turn over. So I put two lag hooks into the sealing joists and used a pair of lock and tackles to lift and flip the slab so it was top side up. Later, when pouring epoxy on each of the four edges, I used these to maneuver and lift the slab so it was vertical with the edge opposite the poor edge resting on the floor. The eight foot long rails that carry the sled were made from one inch metal on electrical conduit screwed to a two by two. A data was cut to hold the conduit in position. Recessed screws from the bottom up into the conduit held it securely in place without distorting its top. The rails were connected to the table frame using diagonal screws starting at the side of the conduit, going through the two by two and into the table two by four. An eight foot long metal saw fence was used to test and adjust each rail so that its top was flat. Clamps and wood scraps were used to hold the fence edge vertical while resting on the rail top. Gap maximums between the fence and the rail were visually located and measured using stacks of playing cards. In this case, there were three gaps of three, one, and four cards. The fence was removed and the screws holding the rail to the table were loosened so that the stacks of playing cards could be inserted below the gaps between the rail and the table. After retightening the screws, the fence was used again to measure the rail flatness. After adjustments, the flatness was within one card thickness, about 12 thousandths of an inch. The router sled base was made from plastic coated particle board about six inches longer than the distance between the rails. The width was carefully cut to be straight and slightly wider than the router base, plus the width of the sides. A slot was cut in the base to clear the router bit. The sides were made from aged maple. The ends were made from plywood. Wood blocks were fastened to the bottom to keep the sled centered between the rails.
The sled and rails could be used manually, but I wanted to add automation that was easy to build and was cheap compared to the cost of the walnut slabs. It only needed to work for this project. The automation was built on a pair of 2x2s that rested on the rails and were connected to the table sides. They define a rectangular region where the automation would move the router. A pair of threaded rods were used to move the router sled, one rod for each end of the sled. These rods were one quarter by 20 threads per inch and six feet long. The two by twos were spaced about five and a half feet apart so the threaded rods could span the distance between them. Three eighths inch ball bearings supported each rod. The outside diameter was one inch and could be pressed into a hole drilled using a one inch Forstner bit. The threaded rods were fit into the bearings using a spacer shaped from a PVC rod with a threaded hole and held in place by a nut. Holes were drilled in the sled sides so that the threaded rods could pass through. A one quarter inch threaded insert was fastened into a hole at each end. The threaded rods were passed through their bearings and screwed into the inserts, adjusted so that the side was parallel to the two by twos and perpendicular to the rails. When the two threaded rods were turned at identical rates, the sled would move perpendicular to the rails. The rods were connected mechanically using pairs of beveled gears and another threaded rod. With this arrangement, driving one rod was to also drive the other rod. A similar arrangement of bearings, spacers, and threaded rod was installed inside the sled. A fixture with a threaded hole was connected to the router using the accessory mounting holes on its side. Rotating the threaded rod moved the router inside the sled. Now, the router could be moved anywhere along the rails or sled by turning the threaded rods. To rotate the rail and sled threaded rods, I used powerful hobbyist servos with 360 degree rotation. Pulses easily generated by a computer caused these servos to rotate clockwise or counterclockwise at speeds from about 60 RPMs down to essentially zero. The servos were coupled to the rods using X-shaped fittings on servos matched to X-shaped slots on the end of the spacers. The electronic components were mounted on the right 2x2. An adjustable power supply was set to about 7.2 volts to power the servos. A small circuit card had two terminal blocks for wiring the power and the control signal to the servos. The next circuit reduced the voltage to 3 volts for the microcomputer and other circuits. The next circuit interfaced four limit switches to the microcomputer. These switches were mounted so they would close when the sled reached the left end of the rail and the right end of the rail, and when the router reached the top end of the sled and the bottom end of the sled. The next circuit was the Raspberry Pi microcomputer that ran the program that made everything work. The final circuit had six button switches that were used to request actions. These actions were pause and continue, alternating between actions, Reset, increase router servo speed, decrease the speed, increase cut width, and decrease the width. To develop the program, I used the Arduino IDE, which is free online. A large international group of robot hobbyists have developed software tools and several manufacturers provide products that make it easy and inexpensive to develop a controller like this. There is probably a robotics club near you if you want to learn more. There were problems when I tried to use the automated sled. The first was the movements were way slower than I expected, only about three inches per minute. This was barely tolerable for moving a sled, but the router movement was so slow the bit burnt the wood because of friction heat. It also shortened the life of the bit. I used a pair of gears to step up the speed by two and a half. I also programmed the router to cut both up and down directions. This made it barely fast enough so I could use it to flatten the tabletop, but it still took over 20 hours. The bit still left burn marks that required extra sanding. I removed the router sled from the work table and went on to make countless mistakes while finishing the table to my satisfaction. This is the slab after sanding and filling the cracks, knot holes, and other voids. It was now ready for the epoxy coating. After the table was finished and moved out of my shop, I reflected on the router sled and gave myself a grade of D, just barely passing. Although I didn't have another project in mind, I decided to build a 2.0 version to fix the most annoying issues before I put it in storage. I reworked the router drive to make it much faster, 
by replacing the threaded rod drive with a bicycle chain drive. I moved the servo from the end to the side and connected the servo directly to a 13 tooth sprocket. An identical sprocket at the other end of the sled returned the chain. I reworked the router fixture so a pair of springs connected it to the ends of the chain. Rollers were added to the fixture to prevent the router from grabbing the sled sides. The spring kept the chain at the right tension and absorbed the shock when the router hit the hard stop limits at the ends. With the new drive at full speed, it took only a few seconds for the router to travel from one end of the sled to the other, and it could still go as slow as before. I modified the program so the router only cut in the proper direction. When the router reached the slide bottom, the sled drive was backed off about a turn, and the router then drove to the top at maximum speed. The sled was then advanced for the desired cut width. The router then drove to the bottom at cutting speed. These changes made a huge difference in the flattening speed and made the cut much smoother. I also replaced the bevel gear transfer with a chain drive. This eliminated two bearings, the transfer shaft, and the four beveled gears. However, since the positions of the drive threaded rods were fixed, rollers were needed to control the chain tension and keep it away from the rails. For new build version, I would move the threaded rods outside the sled box and up by a couple of inches. I also increased the rail speed using the same step-up gears previously used on the router drive. This made the rail speed much less annoying, nearly 8 inches per minute. I estimate this 2.0 version could do the whole slab surface in 2-4 to four hours, depending on the router bit. I tested it on a 2x12x36 by by inch board. The flattened surface was smooth with no burn marks. This is the sled and automation disconnected from the rails and ready for storage. A pair of additional 2x2s were added to stabilize the original 2x2s and the router sled, and to reduce the stress on the pair of threaded rods that moved the sled. I would give this version a grade of B. It's okay for a hobbyist to use. Thanks for watching.